If you turn in your Bibles, we're going to be in two places today. Uh, we're going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 11, and we're going to be in Psalm 51. So you can kind of put your hands in both places. Um, you probably recognize the name because it's infamous of Adolf Eichmann. Adolf Eichmann was the architect of the Holocaust for the Nazis in World War II. Following the war, he escaped down to Argentina and remained in hiding for a number of years. And I don't know if you saw a movie about this or anything, but there was a pretty dramatic thing happened when Israel sent the Mossad up and they found Adolf Eichmann. And they, they captured him and they spirited him out of Argentina down to Israel where he stood trial. And he, it was a capital offense, of course, and the trial was very dramatic. And he was eventually convicted and he, he, was, he was hung. But in the trial itself, they, it was very important for the, for the prosecutors to put forward a good case. And one of the things that they needed was is they needed a Holocaust survivor to come and to give testimony as to what happened there. And so they, they, they found a man named uh, Yedel Zanur to come and to tell his story of what happened to him in Germany in the Holocaust. And uh, later he, re, he told the story to Mike Wallace on CBS News. And he said, uh, when, he, when he came in and he saw Adolf Heichmann in that glass container that they put him in for his prosecution, he saw him sitting there and Denour fell on his face and began to sob. And the courtroom went into just absolute chaos over the scene. And they, they had to stop the trial and they had to come and pick him up and, and, and take a break and, and help him compose himself to come back and be able to give his testimony. And Mike Wallace asked him, what was it about seeing him that made you fall apart like that? And you had such a reaction. He says, were you overwhelmed by the painful memories? Did, the, did, you, did, this, did this trigger you with, with, with thoughts of what happened in the past? And Denour said this. He said, no, it was nothing like that. I was overcome by the realization that what I saw was not a demon, but I saw a normal man. And he said, and it just as much could have been me. All of us have within our hearts and within our capacity the ability to do great evil. There is something within the heart of fallen man that is, that is there. That we realize that we are sinners. And what do we do when we realize that we have fallen short of God's best? How can a person be restored when they have committed sin? How do you face yourself? How do you face your family? your friends, your church. How are you going to face God knowing that he is an eternal judge and you're going to be face to face with him someday? Today we're going to be looking at a story that is of an epic failure and that tells us of amazing grace. Because God has something more powerful than our failure. He has his grace. And he offers us his grace today, and Paul talks about that grace. He says, I did not receive that grace in vain. It transformed me. It changed me. And the Bible even warns us not to resist the grace of God. God's grace is the only antidote for the sin that lurks within all of us. And just like this story that we're going to see our stories can be transformed by grace as well. We're looking at a story today of failure in the most unlikely of people, David. The sweet psalmist of Israel, the shepherd boy who wrote songs out with his, with his flock, the, the, the young man who we saw last week who faced down a giant, the good and just King David did horrible sin. But we're going to, as I said, see that the grace of God overcomes our sin. A little bit of background about you. David was now fully established as king of Israel. Uh, he was now ruling in Jerusalem. He had a perfect winning record in war. We, we've just been in our devotions going through the books of Samuel and Kings and Chronicles. There's no, and David got beat, stories. Everything was a, was a perfect record. During his lifetime, the Philistines, which had plagued Israel from the time of Moses, were defeated once and for all. There's no more problems with Philistines from David's rule forward. 
He took the city of Jebus, which we now call Jerusalem. It was a stronghold that was completely fortified. And the Jebusites said, nobody's going to get us out of here. And Israel, for all its history, didn't get the Jebusites out until David came and took the city and made it his capital. He expanded the borders of Israel. I looked at a map as I was preparing for this week to look at the borders of Israel compared to the borders of Israel today. The borders of Israel during David's reign were more than twice as big as today's Israel. He, he, was, he, was, he was absolutely, everything he was doing was blessed. He had grown very rich. He, uh, he prepared the materials for his son Solomon to build the temple and uh, again, this is just in our devotions this week, and we got out our calculators and figured it up. He had enough silver and gold laid up for the temple that today it would be worth over $500 billion worth of precious metals. Uh, David was at the height of any, what any king could want. He was rich and secure, and he was far from his roots in the field. in sheep. But it was during that kind of height that he fell. If you look at 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1 with me, and we'll go through this as quickly as we can to get to the meat of what we see in Psalm. It said, In the spring, at the time of year when kings go off to war, David sent Joab with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonite, Ammonites and they besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. In his successes... He settled into a comfort in his place with God. The scripture here says it was the spring of the year when kings go to war, but David stayed in Jerusalem. He was at the wrong place at the wrong time. He was supposed to be leading the, 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 the Israelite army, but instead he stayed back and let somebody else take that responsibility. Incrementally, he was changing the course of his life. And I want to say something to you for a moment that this is important for us to consider, that when we fail, we don't do it suddenly, we do it incrementally. A little bit of a change, a little bit of a compromise, a little bit of a, of, of a winking at sin, a little bit of a letting things go, and pretty soon we're far off track. I'm fascinated by trajectory. If I were to be a pilot and I was going to fly a plane, I'm going to go from uh, Seattle and I'm going to fly to Honolulu, and I take off and I, I, my navigation tells me I'm off by one and a half degrees. You're south one and a half degrees. I, oh man, one and a half degrees is no big deal. Do you know I'm going to miss Honolulu? I'm going to miss Hawaii. I'm probably going to end up in Thailand. That little bit of being off a degree or two didn't seem like a lot at the beginning, but incrementally, it took me far from where I wanted to be. Bad things happen when we incrementally start drifting from God, drifting from purpose, drifting from holiness. David actually, in that drift, left, let go of the things that God had called him to and began using his power abusively and selfishly. Because as we see in verse, of, of verse number four, it says, David sent messengers to get Bathsheba. And she came to him and, she, and he slept with her. Then she went back home. There's, there's really no other way to look at it other than David used his power abusively. He didn't send a person, he sent a group. He sent messengers, and she had no, she had, there, there was no saying no to this request or this demand. You're coming over to the palace. Sexual exploitation and cover up are not new. It happened then, it happened before David, and it happens today. Victims are strewn in its path. And in the story we read in Samuel, we soon see that. A good man, one of the 30 inner circle warriors of David, is murdered. A man who was faithful to his wife and family, Uriah, that man, loses his life and loses his family. Bathsheba loses her innocence. David destroys a home, and he destroys the confidence of the nation in his leadership. 
And then he tries to go on his way as if nothing happens. You know that he, he, he engineers the, the death of Uriah so that the pregnancy of, uh, of Bathsheba would seem like it would maybe be his son. And David, can, the, the baby is born, and for maybe up to a year or more, David is covering his sin, acting like nothing happened because he thought he had it covered well. In verse number 27, the Bible says, David brought her into his house. She became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David did had displeased the Lord. It seems kind of almost uh, understated, doesn't it? Displeased. But it was, it, the sin is a terrible, terrible thing that destroys lives. Now, God knows both our heart and our acts, and so David sent Nathan the prophet to go confront David, and he used a parable to do that. And in this parable, there is a man who has uh, many, many sheep, a rich man. And then there's a man who has but one sheep, who this sheep is very, very important to him. And in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 3, here's what uh, Nathan says about that man. It says, the poor man had nothing except one ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food. It drank from his cup. I, I mean, I like animals, but I would not have a sheep drinking from my cup, Okay. It even slept in his arms. This is a cherished family member. It's a pet. It was like a daughter to him. The story resonated with David, a shepherd boy. Yeah, I can see this story, he says. But then he says that the rich man next door has a, uh, has, has a guest come in, a visitor, and he wants to feed him. And instead of taking one of his many sheep that he had that he probably didn't even have any po close personal contact with, he went next door to his neighbor's house, stole that sheep, that little ewe lamb, brought it to his house. He killed it and he ate it and shared it with his friend. David was enraged enraged. Verse 5 says that David burned with anger against the man, and he said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, this man deserves to die. And Nathan says, I just see this, a bony, crooked, arthritic finger points it right at David and says, you're the man. And suddenly David realizes it's not a secret. God knows. And the guilt that has been under the surface is suddenly like a geyser coming up out of him. It's our nature to run from our transgressions. It's in us. As a matter of fact, there's an interesting article in the Eugene Register Guard this week that I just want to share the content of with you. And that is this, the, or, or the Washington State Police have a problem because up in Washington in January, they instituted a new law that says that the police in Washington can't chase you in their car for a traffic violation or some other minor thing. Only, they can only chase you if you're a danger to others, if you're a felon on the run and they know it, or if you're going to commit a sexual offense, then they can chase you. See, do you know what's happening? People aren't stopping. They commit a traffic violation, they run a red light, they don't have the right tags on their car, or some other, or they're speeding, and when the cops pull up behind them and hit the lights and try to get them to pull over, many aren't stopping. So far, the Washington State Patrol says we've had it happen a thousand times this year. Smaller jurisdictions, Puyallup and others are saying the same thing. In Puyallup, the chief said there, on the weekends, on one shift alone, we'll have three to five drivers who refuse to stop and we just have to let them go because people want to run from their transgressions. It's in human nature. If I can get away, I'll get away. But God, I want to give you some good news today. He chases us in our transgressions. <laughs> He chases us. He's, he's after us. He is, he is, his Holy Spirit comes for us and is relentless because we must repent. He does not want us to go into eternity with unconfessed sin in our lives because we'll be lost forever. 
So he chases us in our transgressions to bring us to a place of repentance. Going on in 2 Samuel chapter 12, it's kind of lengthy, but bear with me. Nathan continues to speak to David, and he says, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel and delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house into your master, and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah, and if this had not been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil is in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. So David has a big surprise come to him. And for a lot of people today, this is a shock. Probably the most shocking thing of the story if you think about it. In verse 13, David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. That's a shock. To do all these horrible things and for God to say, I'm taking away your sins, he says, you are not going to die. As a matter of fact, if you know your your Bible Old Testament, The sins that David committed, several of them were capital offenses. He he committed murder, adultery. He had coveted his neighbor's wife. He He had lied. I mean, the Ten Commandments are falling like dominoes in David's life right here. He definitely deserved to be stoned to death. And Nathan said, God has forgiven you. You will not die. Today we're going to learn what grace can do for us. Grace is something that is given to us, is not earned. And we fall into the trap of thinking, I've somehow got to pay God for this forgiveness. I've got to be able to earn this grace. Millions of golfers know the name of Harvey Pennick, Not because he won a lot of tournaments, but because he was a great golf teacher. And in 1992, he met with a friend. He was 90 years old. He had never written a book. He met with a friend and he said, I've got some notes for an idea for a book. His friend was a writer. And he said to him, "Uh, here's my notes for my book. Would you look at it tonight? Tell me if you think there's anything in it. And the title of the book was The Little Red Book for Golfers. His friend looked at it overnight, was so excited about it, he called his friends at Simon & Schuster. And within a couple of days... He had heard back from Simon and Schuster, and he got together with, with his friend, Mr. Pennick, and he said, I've got news for you. He said, Simon and Schuster would agree to publish your book for a $90,000 advance. Harvey was troubled. He said, what? He said, I have a lot of medical bills, and I'm on a fixed income. I can't come up with $90,000 to pay them to publish my book? You're laughing because you know where this is going. And his friend had to explain like three times, no, they want to pay you $90,000 to put that book together, and then after that, all the money starts really coming in. It became, at that time, the number one best-selling sports book ever written. Number one. And he thought he had to buy his way into that, No, it was offered freely. You don't buy your way into God's grace. It's offered freely to you. So let's look at David's path to grace found in Psalm 51. This this is his prayer of repentance and receiving God's grace. In the back of your bulletin, there's some pretty good notes I want you to consider filling in as well. Step one that David took was he asked God to cleanse him. He said, cleanse me. Somebody once said, What filthy excrement is to the body, sin is to your soul. And we need cleansing from it. Kind of a long section here, seven verses, follow along with me. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done evil that is in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. 
Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Three concepts about being cleansed here that David gives us. The first one is the idea of transgression. He said, I have transgressed. I have done transgression. You can write that down. Transgression, it simply means to cross the line of what God has forbidden. God says, you're not to, not to kill your neighbor. He crossed that line. And all these other lines that David crossed, these are all transgressions. These are things that are known that God says, don't cross that line. And David said, please forgive me of my crossing the line, of my transgressions. Secondly, he mentions his sin. He said, my sin is ever before me. Sin is a bit different than transgression. Sin is to miss the mark of the purpose and calling of God in our lives. It literally comes from the idea of, of shooting an arrow at a target, and if you don't hit the target, you sinned, is, the, is what it means. God has placed a purpose on our lives, and when we, when we miss that purpose, when our, when our transgressions take us in a different direction, we're, that, we're now in sin because we're not hitting the purpose of God for our lives. God has a purpose for every one of our lives, and when we in our selfishness, in our rebellion, go our own way, we're sinning. The third thing he mentions here is his iniquity. Iniquity is the twisted, evil nature that lives within us. It's that ugly stream that's there that feeds the sin and feeds the transgression. It's the base, uh, base evil that needs to be dealt with. David said, these three things were all at work within me when I sinned. So he only had one choice because he couldn't buy his way out or be good to get out. He said, I need to ask you by your grace to forgive me, to cleanse me. In doing so, he asked him to blot out his transgressions. Now, this term is an accounting term in, in the original language. To blot out something was to, for there to be uh, an amount owed, and if that amount was going to be forgiven, it was blotted out. So if you owed a million dollars, or a student loan debt, or a car debt, or a, you know, some big thing that you couldn't pay, the benefactor could, or the, the, the person who you owed it to could make the choice to blot it out. You no longer owe it. D David was saying, I can't pay for my sin. Would you blot it out? He also asked for forgiveness. Forgiveness is not expecting that the person who is going to forgive you is saying, oh, it doesn't matter. It really didn't bother me. You know, we do that as people, don't we? If I, if I forget an appointment, if I act rudely to someone, we, we might say, would you forgive me? And then what, what, what the person who is going to forgive them often will say is, oh, it's nothing, right? When we ask God for forgiveness, we're not saying to God, would you forgive me? And then God says, oh, it's nothing. No, it is something. It's very big. So big, in fact, that his son died for your forgiveness. So forgiveness although freely given, is certainly not cheap. And it is not just nothing. It was everything. It really infinitely matters. And he asks God to cleanse him from his sins. This is the removal of defilement from something that's unclean. The removal of that. And the typical thing you see in the Bible when it speaks about being cleansed is a leper in the Old Testament. <clears throat> the, the Bible never refers to, to lepers when they get over their leprosy of being healed. Well, it might some, but most of the time it refers to them as being cleansed. That leprosy is a type or a, uh, an example of sin, and when the leprosy is taken away, that leper is now cleansed, and then they would go so show themselves to the priest, who would, uh, the spiritual leader of the nation, would say, you are cleansed from your uncleanness. And so when David is asking God to forgive him, he says, would you cleanse me? Take away this horrible sin that's within me. 
it needs to be completely washed away from me, which takes us to the last word, wash me clean. David asked God, would you please wash me clean? That wash is to remove something that is impossibly stained. Sometimes I'll give my wife a shirt that I've stupidly worn out into my shop. I'm changing the oil or working with glue or, uh, or some other thing in my shop. And I come in and I go, oh, look, Chris, this, this pretty good shirt has now got this on it. And she'll say to me, the news I do not want to hear, that is not coming out. You know what I'm talking about, guys? Here's the really bad one, her nice tablecloth. And you were sitting there. And that is not coming out. David says, would you take from my life that which is not naturally able to come out? No good amount of work, nothing I can do, no change of my mind can make that stain come out. He says to God, would you make me whiter than snow? Take out which can't come out. As he was pleading for this cleansing, David is agreeing with God about the severity of his sin. This is bad. This is bad. We read it, but look again at verse 3 and 4. I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and are justified when you judge. David had lied to himself and he said, this won't hurt. He says, it won't hurt my relationships. It won't hurt other people. This is a private matter, but it hurt many. It hurt Bathsheba. It destroyed a marriage. Uriah died. The baby son dies. His family, as Nathan foretells, would have calamity in the household. In his responsibilities, he thought no one will ever know, but right off the bat, people knew. He had trusted military partners who had to go out and see to the murder of Uriah. And, he probably, and he, we know he hurt his relationship with God, all the time thinking, I'm just too big to fail. I'm too, I'm too big a deal. It's not a problem. But it was all true. The second thing that David said, learned, was, and he asked God, he says, God, please restore me. Not only would you forgive me, but would you restore me? And this is actually a really bold thought that I have done so bad. But to know that God can not only forgive me, but he can restore me and put me back in a place where I have dignity and purpose in my life. We all need restoration, not just forgiveness. Looking at verse 8 through 12, he says, Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. David was experiencing the full weight of his failure and his sin. It was inescapable, and he begged God because he said, my sin is always in front of me. I can't, I can't forget about this. So David needed restoration in some specific areas. And if you today need God's grace, you need restoration in these areas as well. He said, I need to have joy and gladness again in my life. Oh, it's, I, I want to have that place where there's just really true joy in my life, that there's really true happiness there. Not just a passing or a surface joy. The Hebrew word there just means deep joy. It's not just Kind of there. It's not just that it looks good to everybody else, but deep in my heart I feel joy. He asked for purity, which just means unadulterated, untainted life. To not have to look at himself in a mirror and go, I'm a contaminated loser. He asked God to give him a steadfast spirit which simply means that he wanted his spirit renewed and repaired. His inner life was broken. And when we sin 
And when it's been there for a while and it's been unrepented and it's not been dealt with, pretty soon we realize something's busted in me. Something's broken in me. Something's not right. The spiritual machinery of my being is not working. It's not clicking. The gears are not meshing. I, I'm limping through life. And he asked God to give him a repaired spirit. He called this a steadfast and a willing spirit that would, that would be the same every day. When he got up in the morning, he could say, I am again walking in God's grace today. He knew he couldn't go forward without this. He said, I need this to sustain me. If I'm going to go through life, it can't be like it is right now. I need some changes for the future. And he was basically saying, if you don't do this work in me, I'm just going to repeat my sin again. And some of you have had that very thing happen. You've asked God to forgive you, but you haven't got that renewed spirit to sustain you, and you find yourself revisiting the old sin again, or even going further into another failure again. The grace of God gives you that new renewed spirit to sustain you for going forward that you do not find yourself repeating. The third step he asked God to give him. He says, please use me. This is another bold step. After all I've done wrong, I'm asking you to use me in the future. That you don't have to put me on the shelf. You don't have to, you don't have to put me on the bench for the rest of my life. You can use me. He wanted to regain his purpose. He wanted his ministry back. Look at the things he wanted to do. Verse 13, he says, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. He says, I want my responsibility back as the teacher of Israel. He wanted to be at the head of worship and praise. Verse 15, open my lips and my mouth and I will declare your praise. This is the man who said, I love to go into the house of God with the people of God, the procession and the instruments and lead them. He says, I want that back. He wanted to direct the affairs of this marvelous nation that God had given. Verse 18, he says, In your good pleasure, make Zion prosper. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. He knew that his unrepentant sin could make the whole thing collapse. He said, no, let me lead this nation into greatness. And David knew for these things to happen, for God to use him, it was going to take an amazing work of God. In verse 16, he says, you don't delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You don't delight in burnt offerings. David was amazingly wealthy. He could have provided 100,000 cattle for an offering. He could have brought all the money that you could imagine into the coffers of the temple. He could have, he could have paid anything for, to get out of this, but it wouldn't have made a difference. He said, God, you're not looking for those kind of offerings. Verse 17, he says, what you're looking for, God, is a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. One that simply says, I am throwing myself on the mercies of God. I want to ask you today, personally now, have you failed and you need the grace of God? Are you right now in that place of failure? You need the grace of God. This isn't a story about David and we can sit here and cluck our tongues and fold our arms and say, that guy, you know, I hope he learned his lesson, huh? Yeah. Oh no, this is a, this is a story about us. That, that we, we have within us that same monster that allows sin to take control. That same demon that comes and, and, and brings people down, other people down, exists in us, and we need forgiveness of sin. Do you need the grace of God today? David said, let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. We might look at that and say, pretty harsh, God, crushing David's bones. Can I tell you that the crushing you feel over your unrepented sin or the sin that you just kind of dealt with but never finally put to rest, that crushing is from God. 
because he wants your attention. He has to get us to look at him straight in the face and to say, it's against you and you only that I have sinned, O God. If you break a bone and you feel pain, that's good. Because you would just go on blindly hurting yourself even worse if it weren't for the pain. Pain's a signal. David experienced the crushing of his life under the weight of his sin. And today, if you sense a pain, those of you at home or those of you here, from your sin, that is God's messenger to you that it's time to repent. You can follow the steps of David today. We're going to open up an altar of prayer for you now, even as David did, to simply say, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. He can cleanse you from your sin. And when you pray, we pray as David did, it's against you and you only that I have sinned. I've done evil in your sight, and you are proved right when you judge. When you say this is wrong, you're right. When, when I realize I'm going to face you someday in eternity, that's true. And so I choose to face you today. I choose to face you now and receive your grace now. Isaiah has a wonderful scripture when he says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I remember your sins no more. God says, I am the one who blots out your transgressions. I do it for me. I do it for you. I do it for us so that your sins will be remembered no more. You deal with God today with your sin, you won't deal with him tomorrow in heaven with it. He'll just welcome you in, pure and righteous in his sight. The word repent in early Hebrew means to take a deep breath. Actually, the word evolved in understanding as the scriptures went forward. From early in the Old Testament forward, we see more and more color brought into the word repent. At first, take a deep breath, stop and breathe in that sense of I need to change. It's a feeling of remorse, of self-judgment that I'm wrong. But then it began to understand some other things that it was not only am I wrong, but I need to turn and go another direction. So the direction that took me this way into sin and selfishness and failure is wrong. And now I'm through repentance, I not only have a sense of feeling that it's bad, but I'm going to turn and go another way. But then there was even a third understanding that came again as the word went forward. It's not just that you're going to turn and go another way. You're going to turn and you're going to go toward God. Some of us repent and just go off on another bad direction. But true repentance says, I am going to go into the arms of God. That's where real life change happens. It's not just that you feel bad, but that you go to the one who can actually heal you of your sin. Jesus said, repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. It was good news. He's going to restore your life. Not going to fix up your old one. He's going to give you a new one. I, I, I've done some building through the years and there have been times when we looked at what the project was and realized it's better off just sawing this all down. Just starting over. This wall hasn't got it. This roof is so bad. Just take it all down and start over. God does not fix your old life so you can limp through life and just you know, barely make it through the pearly gates. He's gonna give you a brand new life. Would you stand up with me today? David said, and it sounds kind of uh, a little cryptic to us, but let's unpack it. He said, cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Hyssop is a bush. But they used it at the Passover 
when, when, the, when the children of Israel were going to leave Egypt, they took the hyssop bush and they dipped it in the blood of the lamb and they put it on the doorpost of their house. And that was their sign of salvation from the death angel. When Jesus died on the cross, they offered him a drink on a hyssop bush because his blood was being shed for us. And David says, cleanse me with hyssop washed whiter than snow. John said, the blood of Jesus, God's son, purifies us from all sin. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed today, I just want to know how many people here would say, Pastor, wow, you've been reading my mail. There are things in my life that need the grace of God today unrepentant, hidden things, things that I, I've assumed that uh, somehow I can get through life, I'll cover up, nobody's going to know, but now I know God knows, and the crushing I feel in my heart is his, his messenger to me, it's time to repent. And I know that I will be received by him with open arms for restoration, for cleansing, for a new hope, a new life, and a new direction.